Despite talking about technology, I'm afraid I have no slides at all. Um, but I, I wanted to take this opportunity to speak about a specific example, because my feeling is that every time people talk about these concepts, they just remain concepts, and they're nice theories, but they're, they're, it's very hard to ground them. Um, as Marco said, I'm special projects editor at The Guardian, which is a privileged position uh, in that I have the honor, really, of trying to um, lead some of The Guardian's innovative approaches to things like crowdsourcing, whatever it means. But I will, as well as doing my own reporting, manage teams of reporters on special projects that we think are amenable to this kind of journalism. Um, and we, we do this, I guess, a lot. I think the, the first thing to say is in The Guardian, um, the idea that uh, people will know more than we do on particular subjects and it's in our interest to have a conversation with them is embedded in everything we do. Uh, but there are some cases where actually that doesn't apply, some types of journalism where that could be even counterproductive. But the, the example I'm going to give you I think is one in which it absolutely did apply and I'm going to speak to you about the riots in England in August. They were the biggest home news story um, in the UK of last year. Five people died. It was the biggest bout of civil unrest in a generation in England. Unprecedented degrees of uh, violence um, spreading from town and city to city. You will have heard about it, I'm sure. But it posed a real challenge for all journalistic outfits. And I think the, the challenges were manifold, but if you think, first of all, uh, it was dangerous. It's dangerous to be a journalist in the midst of a riot because you are targeted. People don't want you to record what is happening. So if you have a big camera, or if you have a, a big microphone, you're trying to speak to rioters, you're in trouble. And I saw around me many journalists being attacked. Some of them were quite seriously injured. Some of them, I think, were lucky to, to, to live. Um, so it was a very difficult environment to report in. And when the riots began, they lasted four days. Um, I went to report them with everybody else. I mean, it's my view that um, even editors should leave the office. And we're all better journalists if we, if we report from the ground at the beginning. So how did we do that at the beginning? How did we do what I would call collaborative journalism in the riots? Well, it was dangerous, but it was also across a huge scale. And even if you were to have all of the journalists in Europe, probably, and put them on different street corners around England during the riots, you still wouldn't have enough journalists to cover an event of that scale happening simultaneously in so many different places. So the answer is, you use other people who can help um, report. And for me personally, and I'll talk first of all about my personal journey through the riots, um, it meant that the first tool of reporting had to be Twitter. Um, it's the most pure, instant way of reporting. I mean, for people who see it as some kind of um, newfangled approach to journalism, which uh, uh, it, it, uh, it is not as faithful to truth um, and is chaotic, you, you should really rethink what, what Twitter reporting can be. You're writing in a very short, punchy way facts and giving them out. Um, but it is at the same time quite different because the nature and the process of reporting um, requires a conversation, rather than the journalist being uh, the, the, the arbiter of truth, telling the readers what has happened, often the readers will tell the journalist what is happening. So for me, Twitter reporting, so using Twitter to send out pieces of information from the ground as I traveled around London, north and south, and then later to Birmingham and other cities around England, I was often asking questions. And asking questions is something that journalists think they should do in private, and then in public they tell what the answers are. Um, actually, it can often be the other way around. So I'd ask questions of people on Twitter, ask them where I should go. If I was reporting the LA riots, and I wanted to know where to go, I probably would have followed the plumes of smoke, or chased ambulances, and perhaps I would get lucky. But with Twitter, I could ask instantly if I was in one area of London, where are the riots happening? I remember one incident where I saw a group of rioters chased away by police on horseback, and they just ran into the distance. I had no idea where they went. 
But with Twitter, you would instantly get a response from people who are looking at things outside of their window. They would give you an address. They would be specific. So it's a collaborative process. They would tell you, the journalist, when you're wrong. They would be an editor. They would help you decide where to go, when, the tone of your reporting. So much of the journalistic process was influenced by the people I was interacting with. And at the end of the four days, I'd accumulated 35,000 new Twitter followers. And what makes them interesting, I think, is that they aren't follower. Follower is a kind of, it's not really a very useful term because they weren't passive. These weren't people who were just, in a traditional sense, reading what I was telling them. They were assisting me in the reporting process and they felt they had a stake too. Because the riots were so dangerous, mainstream news organizations like the BBC and Sky News at times had to withdraw their reporters. And so on the television, you had pictures repeating themselves of incidents which had happened five or six hours earlier. And people were desperate to know what was happening on their streets. And they turned to Twitter, and Twitter had a surge in activity, as you would imagine, but it had more new users, more people using Twitter, bigger increase than any of the mainstream news organizations. So it was a really valuable and interesting process for all of us. Um, but that was the kind of instant reporting. It, it, we then came after the riots to trying to work out why they had happened. As I said, this was a really remarkable incident for the UK, for its history, but nobody really quite understood, just like with the riots in Paris, exactly why so many people had come out to take part in the violence and take part in the looting. And as you can imagine, people gave quite predictable explanations. So the right would say it was family breakdown, the left, it was some kind of protest against austerity cuts. But what nobody was doing was reliable, empirical research into the riots to find out why they'd happened. And a colleague of mine saw a blog, and the blog linked back to a study that was done in Detroit in 1967. And in Detroit, a group of journalists teamed up with a group of academics, and they went out into the community after the riots, which are the deadliest riots in, in the US, and interviewed people who had been rioting themselves. So they spoke to the people responsible, and they asked them why they'd been doing it. And we wondered whether this was something that we could replicate. So this was in the days and weeks after the riots. And I think we were quite successful. But what we tried to do was do it in a collaborative way. So we thought, we want to speak to large numbers of people who are involved. Um, we needed an academic partner. So in Detroit, it was a university and the Detroit Free Press newspaper that did it. What we did, first of all, was seek the assistance of the London School of Economics University. So we had a, a, an academic partner. Then we needed money. And as I, I mentioned in the presentation before, we got funding from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and the Open Society Foundation. So money to run a research project to interview people who were involved in the riots. But then we as journalists, we don't have the staff to do this. We don't have enough people to interview large numbers of people for a valid academic study. So we asked people. We put a, a, an application form on our website. We had 450 people apply to be researchers. We paid them. And we hired 30 researchers across London, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, and Nottingham, all cities where there had been riots. We trained them and they spent a month tracking down people who were involved in the riots and interviewing them. And these were long, in-depth, qualitative and quantitative interviews. And at the end of the month, we tracked down, we'd managed to interview 270 rioters. That's a large number. In Detroit, they, they interviewed about 40. And what that gave us was a huge resource. I mean, we put all of these interviews, we transcribed them, put them into a database, did a word count on the database, and it was 1.3 million words. So that's 1.3 million first-person accounts from rioters about their experiences of the biggest bout of civil unrest in a generation. And we could subject that database to serious academic analysis with a team of analysts based at the LSE. We also had a, a database given to us by Twitter of 2.5 million tweets, which were sent out during the riots. And our study, we called it Reading the Riots, was um, launched uh, about four weeks ago, ran over five days, and we found a number of things. And some people criticized us because they thought that it was wrong to 
interview rioters. They said that we were perhaps excusing their behavior. But I think what we did was good on many levels. I think it was important. I think it will have a legacy. Um, but more than anything else, I think the process of doing it um, is a process that we'll see more and more of in the future. It was a process of collaborative journalism. It was working with people who were not journalists, whether the academic partners from the London School of Economics or the researchers. These 30 researchers we had working for us, some of them were trainee journalists, some of them experienced journalists, others were lecturers, we had a taxi driver, we had somebody who worked in a boxing gym as a fitness instructor. They were all people who had good interviewing skills, we trusted them, and most importantly, they had good connections with the communities that had rioted. So they had an in where a journalist would perhaps struggle or take longer to do it. So it was a, a new way of approaching a kind of a, a journalistic conundrum. And looking back at the riots from the time we began with 140 character tweets and all those followers helping us report the riots when they were happening, to the big research study with the London School of Economics, I um, take hope from it because I think it undermines three of the core myths that we hear a lot about when we hear about crowdsourcing and innovative approaches to journalism. One of the myths is that journalists are being replaced. So we're no, we're no longer required. Um, citizen journalists and bloggers will replace us and we will no, no longer have a job. What the riots showed was that people gravitated around journalists. So journalists, the function of journalists changed. You know, it wasn't just me alone. Um, it was me working as a hub of, of a wider community, whether a community of Twitter followers or a community of researchers. So certainly this couldn't have happened without journalists and journalism. Secondly, we're told that, that we have a lack of resources. And in many ways that's true because we're all, certainly those who work in the commercial sector or for newspapers, we're losing money. But the resources I had when I was reporting the riots on the ground was phenomenal. 35,000 people who wanted to help, who wanted to advise, who could help me report. And the resources that I had when I was researching the riots in the last three months, again, phenomenal. A team of 30 researchers across the country and another kind of 10 or so academics. Um, and of course, funding from you know, a non-traditional stream, two foundations which wouldn't have previously funded a type of journalism of this kind. So we do have resources. We might need to think imaginatively about how we get them, but we do have resources. And then finally, this idea that there's a lack of quality. And I kind of object to this notion that there's somehow um, a, 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 an issue when it comes to the quality, because you can say a lot in a 140 character tweet. And again, it was journalists, not non-journalists, that were receiving the followers. And when I look at the research study that we did, you know, the longest story that we wrote, I wrote, was 4,000 words. So it went from a tweet of 140 characters during the riots to three months later, a story of 4,000 words. And we ran a series of in-depth, detailed, empirical journalism um, over a period of five days. Perhaps if you totaled it up, 25,000, 30,000 words. So for anyone who says that this new era is simply temporary, um, that it's all about short blogs or short tweets, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I accept that the position that we're in at the moment is difficult financially, but there could not be a more exciting position in terms of the future of where we're all headed.